presence of God is here. It, uh, it don't matter if we're inside a big beautiful building. We're in a tent somewhere. Uh, some people never have a church building to worship in. They're outside all the time. Or we're in a parking lot. It just don't matter. Right. It's just all about Him and the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Uh, it don't matter if the pastor has a, a Bible degree or the worship team is professional and singing in perfect pitch or harmony. It don't matter if you're all dressed up this morning or if you're just still in your pajamas. Uh, it's all about Him. It's all about the presence of God. And we just welcome His Holy Spirit in, the, in our midst today as we, as we worship Him.
Is that the way you feel? I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Hallelujah. David said that he'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of his Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And I, I know how he feels because I've been born again. I've been saved and been delivered from my flesh, been delivered from the way of life that I used to live. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that each one of you is here. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for your giving. Uh, just because you've been out of God's house, uh, uh, the giving hasn't stopped. You have been faithful, so faithful in your giving, and we thank you so much. And, and in saying that, uh, next Sunday, which we would normally announce, uh, the first Sunday of the month, building fund offering and buddy barrel next week. So we'll make that available as well if you want to give uh, to those uh, outlets as well. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles with you, Turn to the book of 1 Samuel. Hallelujah. 1 Samuel chapter number 10. And we're going to skip around a little bit. Hallelujah. Is it all right if I wear my shades? <laughs> it is bright up here. First uh, Samuel chapter number 10 and beginning at verse number one, and then we're going to go to chapter 13. First Samuel chapter number 10 and verse number one says, then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head, upon Saul's head and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance or king of the Israelites. The first king of the Israelites was Saul. Uh, chapter number 13 and verse number one, this is actually a couple years later, it says Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul at Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and a 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin, and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. Verse five, and the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand, which is on the seashore for multitude. Imagine the picture. And they came up and pitched at Michmash, eastward from Bethel, or Bethaven, excuse me, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait or they were in a pickle, if you want to clear up the King James there. For the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves, in thickets, and in rocks, and in high places, and in pits, anywhere they could get to hide from the enemy. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, notice, trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Instead of Samuel, he offered the offering himself. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, uh, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together to Michmash, therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Preaching from the title this morning, it's hard to stay humble. It's hard to stay humble. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege once again. Lord, even though we can't gather in this building behind me, Lord, we get to gather, Lord, like we are now. And we thank you for that. 
And we thank you for the ones that are here, Lord, hungry to hear your word and desirous to keep, Lord, uh, their souls fed and, and strengthened in you. And the, the days in which we live, Lord, we need it more and more. And Father, I just ask that you would anoint this word as it goes forth. Father, I ask that you would anoint me your servant because I can't do it without you. Father, we ask your anointing in Jesus' name. And God's servant said, amen and amen. It's hard to stay, it's a key word, it's hard to stay humble. As God's servants, he has called us to be humble. He's not only called us to be humble, but to what? To stay humble. Not only to start out good, but to stay humble. Staying humble involves being submissive to the ones he has placed in our lives for our benefit. If we are not submissive, we won't have a teachable spirit. If we are not submissive, we won't have a teachable spirit. That word submissive means ready to conform to authority. You know, that's regardless of age, that's regardless of gender. Uh, and also, it means meekly obedient. So, ready to conform to authority, meekly obedient, that's submissive. It lines up with the word humble. And if we don't have a teachable spirit, church, we will wind up rebelling against the very will of God. Sometimes we don't know it, but we will rebel against the very will of God as Saul did. But if we'll stay humble, he'll take us higher than we ever have before. He said, if you would have just waited on me, Samuel said, Saul, if you would have just waited on me, your kingdom would have been established forever. Church, when God calls anyone to do his work, he usually calls the humble. He usually calls the humble. They will either be humble to begin with, or they will be humble by the magnitude of the calling. Think of Gideon. Think of Moses. I, I, you know, I can't. I can't speak. Or, you know, I, I'm least among my family. I, I, I just can't do it. Saul, even before being anointed as king, had a humble spirit. Matter of fact, uh, Samuel went looking for him, and he was hiding among the people. And Scripture says that he was head and shoulders taller than everybody, so he's, you know, he's six foot eight or whatever, and he's trying to hide in among the people because he's just, uh, he, he's, he's, he's bashful, he's shy, or he don't think he can or whatever. But he has a humble spirit. First Samuel nine twenty one. Uh, he, he, this is what he said to, to Samuel. Uh, Don't you know that I'm a Benjamite, the smallest of the tribes of Israel? My family is the least of all the families in the tribe. So not only am I from the smallest tribe, but my family is the least among uh, all the families within the tribe. So he's, he's basically saying, why would you even talk to me? Why would you even ask me uh, this? That's the position, church, that we must start out in, and that's the position that we must maintain as we are walking with God. We must remain in a humble place, a humble position. First uh, Peter 5 and verse 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. And we understand we need to respect those that are older than us. Church, we need to respect everybody. The, the verse goes on, Amen. It says, yea, all of you. How many does that cover? That covers everybody here, right? All of you be subject, that means submit, one to another and be clothed with humility for God resisteth or opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Uh, I've heard one say, well, they, they're just a young whippersnapper. Or he don't know what he's talking about or she don't, doesn't know what she's talking about. Church, we need to be open to who God puts in our life. We need to be open to what he is trying to present to us because age is not the key here. It's operating with humility towards all. He starts out the verse saying, you know, younger, you need to respect the older, but then he goes into everybody needs to show respect to one another and be submissive to one another, clothed with humility. I... Um, I usually share, and I'll, I'll go ahead and share it today. Many of, most of you have heard it, but some of you haven't. And some of you that have, you just close your ears, that's fine. Because I haven't heard a better illustration to come uh, out than this, that uh, one day there's a businessman going down the highway and his, 
his wheel runs off of his uh, car as he's going to work and he, he uh, of course stops right there in his tracks where he's at and he happens to stop beside an insane asylum there's a chain link high chain link fence right there to his right and he, he goes over and he's looking at his uh, uh, tire that's there and he, he rolls it up and, and he's scratching his head and there's a guy that is in the insane asylum he's out there on the fence and he's got his fingers in the fence and he's looking at this business guy and, and the guy's still just standing there standing there and he says hey what you doing? The guy hollers from behind the fence and he says, I I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna get on to work since I don't have any lug nuts. All my lug nuts has gone off the tire since it rolled off, I don't know where they're at. He said, well, why don't you take one off the other three and put on that one and then go ahead and get on to work and then afterwards when you can get to a service department, you can get it fixed. And the guy just hesitates sometimes like I do when my wife says something correct and I go to look at her. He turns and he looks at the man and he says, you're not crazy. And he says, yes, I am, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> Church, we can learn from anybody. We can learn from a, a child. We can learn from an older person. We can learn from a person that we might consider uh, to not be uh, on the level with us in society or whatever the, the thought may be. We can learn from anybody in this life so we've got to be clothed with humility if we're going to receive much help and strength from God it's going to be because we're operating in humility he said he opposes the proud but he gives grace to the humble uh, 2 Corinthians 12 9 says uh, the Lord speaking to uh, Paul here he says my grace is sufficient my grace is all you need. In other words, my grace is sufficient for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul was having a time within his flesh. He was having a thorn in his flesh, whatever that is. He was having an issue and he kept praying, remove it, God, remove it, God. And God said, my grace is sufficient when you're at your weakest point. Church being humble is not actually weak. It's actually strong. But it's, it's telling God, God, I can't do this without you. I can't even walk without you holding my hand. You see, his grace can only be released to someone who is humble. If we are full of pride, we can't receive and operate in his favor because he said he will oppose you and he will oppose me. If a person is to receive the grace of God called salvation, for instance... It will be because that individual has to come to a humble place and say, I'm a sinner and I know that I'm lost. Before God's grace is released and for salvation, a person has to come to that place and be humble. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So churches, if there's any lifting up, it's going to be, that, it's going to be God that's lifting up. It's going to be God that's putting you up on a plateau. Uh, First uh, Samuel 10, 1, a reference there. Sam, Samuel tells Saul after he pours the oil on his head, the Lord has anointed you to be king. He starts out good. He does everything right, apparently, or according as we see uh, read behind the scriptures. Samuel tells Saul some things to do, and he does each one of them. But... He does each one of them without fail. Why does he do them without fail? Because he's humble. Because he's, he's operating from a teachable spirit. Not one that I can do this or let me do it my way, but he's operating in the humbleness. 1 Samuel 13, 1, we see that Saul has apparently walked in an obedience to the Lord for about two years. Anyone can be taught... But to continue to learn and to submit, one has to maintain a teachable spirit. Anybody can be taught. But how many knows you can't teach somebody that's it's like that? So anybody can be taught, but to continue to learn and to continue to submit, you got to continually be clothed with humility. That's why, church, that you have to die to your flesh daily with the power of Jesus within you. That's why you uh, have to die to that flesh daily with the Lord's help. 
so that you won't uh, be prideful. To be a true leader, one can't truly lead unless he or she is willing to be led. In church, he's called us all to be leaders. You might say, oh, I don't, want, I don't want to get up in front of nobody and speak. Well, he may not have called you to do that, but he has called you to speak for him. He has called you to go out and to your neighbors and your friends and strangers and tell them about the Lord, to be a leader in that respect. And to be a leader, you got to be able to be led. Saul was called to the highest position in all of Israel, and he had the best and most committed and godly teacher that was walking the planet, I believe, at that time by the name of Samuel. But Saul began to lose his teachableness. Why? Because he began to lose his humbleness. When we began to lose our humbleness, we began to lose our teachableness. You see, there is a danger in that we have, when we have served the Lord in our calling for a while, listen to me, saints. There is a danger that when we have served the Lord in our calling for a while, we can have a tendency to lose our reverence of him. We, we may not know it. We may not realize it. It just kind of sneaks up on us, kind of like the, the toad in the kettle as the heat is being turned up. We don't realize that we're losing that. This uh, reverence that I'm talking about is respect mingled with fear and love. Respect mingled with fear and love. It's kind of like my dad, when I used to hear his voice when I was little, he'd say, Richard Earl! Yeah, I gave away my name. Richard Earl! And boy, I knew then there was, there was fear. I knew that he loved me, <laughs> but there was fear that run through my veins at the same time because I knew that I had done something that I wasn't supposed to. Church, we have to have reverence for the Lord. For two years, Saul was doing pretty good. He sees many miracles and many battles won by the Lord. And as he has listened and followed God's prophet. But Samuel, in 1 Samuel 13, 8, had told Saul to gather Israel and stay in Gilgal for how long? Seven days. Stay there for seven days. He didn't say in the morning if I hadn't made it. He didn't say at noon if I hadn't made it. He didn't say at three o'clock if I hadn't made it. He said, stay there for seven days and I will come. Israel began to fear. This was the test to see if Paul, if Saul, excuse me, would trust the Lord or he would trust his own flesh. You know, the apostle Paul said that we are to not trust our flesh, not one iota, not one bit, not for one second. Yeah. How many understands you can't overcome in your flesh? Yeah. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop smoking. I'm going to stop cussing. I'm going to, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to, I'm going to start witnessing Church, you can't do anything without God's help. You can't do anything without the help of Jesus. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Many times the same thing happens, you see, in our lives as it happened to Saul. We do pretty good for a period of time. Why? Because we're walking in humility and a realization of who God is. So he helps us to have victory after victory after victory we know that we can't do without him, so he honors us because we're honoring him. But then a greater test comes. Everything is not falling into place as it was before. Everything is not just working and clicking like we want it to, maybe. Could it be that God has allowed a situation to come our way to correct something deeper within us? And he understands he's always working on you and me. Always tweaking, always fixing. Don't ever think that you have arrived. Because when you get to the place to think you've arrived, he'll show you that you hadn't. <laughs> Stay humble. Could it be that there's a problem he's trying to work out? Will we follow his leading or will, try, will we try to fix it ourselves? Kind of like Saul did. You see, Saul gives in to circumstance. He calls for the sacrifice to be brought to him, the burnt offering. It wasn't his place. It wasn't his place to do this. This was the, the prophet Samuel's place. And, and he offered it instead of waiting on Samuel. He got to looking around and saying, man, I, I got to do this. I got to make this happen myself. So Saul did it. 
And church, it was mere ritual. I said it was mere ritual. It wasn't done with the reverence that it was supposed to. It wasn't done with that godly fear, God going to strike me type of a thing. It was just a mirror going through the motions. This is what we do. And then we can, you know, we can have victory. This was not only against God's prescribed order, but Saul did it with no reverence and fear in his heart. You see, we can get caught up into the same place after serving him and being blessed by him. We can start going through the motions. You ever started going through the motions? I was thinking as we was worshiping a while ago, you know, we can, we can get to the place to worship, worship. Right. We can get to the place that it's all about me. Just let me feel good, God. Touch me one time. Woo! But how many knows worship's all about him? Right. It's all about glory. You know, the song says, I'm sorry for the way that I've made it. The song that she sang earlier, I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I'm just saying another song. And sometimes we can be, our mind can be way off somewhere else. We can come to the place to not reverence the sacrifice. How many understands what the sacrifice is? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. There's only one sacrifice. He is the one sacrifice for all time. But we can come to the place not to reverence the sacrifice like we should. We can just go through a motion. We can go through a pretense. Church, there's only one, one that can go before us to God. There's only one that God would honor. I can't say, God, I come to you in the name of Richie. He'll say, mm -hmm. but when I say, God, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I know he's all ears. And his heart is open. Hallelujah. Because I'm reverencing him. I'm humbling myself before him. I know that there's only one way. Jesus paid it all. And all to him. I owe. As the song says. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do. Do it with all thy might. I don't know what place or position that God has called you to. But whatever he's called you to do, church, do it with everything that is within you. Be the best that you can be. That one day you can stand before him and say, Lord, I, I ushered my best ushering. Lord, I, I cleaned my best cleaning for you. Lord, I mowed the yard for you. Lord, I witnessed as much as I could witness for you. Whatever God has called you to do, he's called us all to witness. But we are to do it with all of our might. I don't know what Samuel's God has placed or will place in your life, but he's placed them there for a reason. They may be older. They may be younger. They may not uh, think on your level or whatever it is, but Hammy understands we're clothed with humility and we're all ears to listen, hallelujah, or we should be. All that we do should be done the best that we can do because it's all to the glory of God. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not to trip you up when God brings hard things or allows hard things to come your way. It's not to trip you up or make life hard. But all things are working, church, together for your good. Do you believe that verse? You know, it's, it's nice to quote it when everything is going well and it's roses, but when things hit the fan, when things are in the trash can, when things are awful, when everything in the kitchen sink is coming against you, do we look at that verse the same way? Lord, I don't understand this. I don't know why. But I do know this. I know your word is true. And I know all things work together for my good. You've got to trust him. I've got to trust him. No matter the test, no matter how dark it looks, stay humble. Stay in a humble place by knowing that you can't even walk without God holding your hand. You can't even walk without Jesus leading you through it. He may still use a child or, or someone that you wouldn't think about. He may use somebody to enlighten you. How many has ever been taught by a child? I know I have. 
and I wanted sometimes to crawl in a hole because a little child says something profound or they said something out of the genuineness of the heart and the Lord taught me a lesson. Church, we've got to be humble, clothed with humility. He wants to encourage us however he can encourage us, but to have a teachable spirit, we have to stay humble. Trust in the power of the sacrifice. Don't lean to your own understanding as Saul did. Trust what God has put in place. It's his time and his way. God, you said, well, keep holding, keep trusting, keep confidence in what he said. You can and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. It's hard, I would admit, it's hard to stay humble. Sometimes we want to be prideful. Sometimes somebody hurts our feelings. And we want to be mad at them for a while. Because that's what they deserve. Right? But we're different when we come to God and we say, Lord, forgive me. And what if God was to back up and cross his arms and say, no, you... You roll around in this puppy for a little bit. The word of God says if we confess our sins, he's what? He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And church, we're to forgive others even as the Lord forgives us. How many knows that's humbleness? That's walking in humbleness. It's hard to stay humble, but with Jesus' help, you can stay there and he'll help you as each challenge that you face comes. No matter how dark it gets, no matter how um, concerning it may be, church, stay humble. Stay clothed with humility. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get on God's opposite side. And that's what it says that we do when we become prideful. Well, we don't want to forgive or, or we don't want to do what we're told or we, we want to say, well, that, that young and he don't know what he's talking about. Scripture says we're opposing God when we uh, are functioning in pride, when we're functioning in a proud way. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, I believe it's pierced all of our hearts today. As we take inventory of our lives, as we look at our own lives and say, Lord, there has been times that I've opposed you that I've, I've been proud because I didn't want to do what you asked me to do. Lord, there's been times that I didn't want to forgive when I knew that you have wholeheartedly forgiven me. Lord, forgive us as a church family. Forgive us as one right now that's crying out of their own heart saying, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for my pride. And that's all that it is. Lord, we don't want to operate in pride. Lord, you were the uh, epitome of walking in humbleness. Help us to walk like you, Jesus. Help us, Lord God, to not render evil for evil, but help us, Lord God, to walk in a consciousness of you, in a reverence of you. Lord, and in, in, a, Lord, in a consciousness to know that each and every person we come in contact with is your child, and they're just as important to you as we are. So, Father, we just ask that you would help us. Lord, I pray, Lord, if there's one listening that does not know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray, Lord, that they would cry out of the depths of their spirit right now. They would cry out of the depths of their soul. Lord, forgive me. That they would enter into that humbleness and they would allow you to wash them. Lord, you, as the song says, you wash the vilest sinner clean. Father, we ask for your help right now. We ask, Lord God, that you would, Lord, that that one that is listening would cry out right now saying, Jesus, I believe that you died for me. And I believe that I'm a sinner, just like the word says, all is sin and fallen short. Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart and save me. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for those, Lord, that have done so right now. We thank you for the ones that are listening saying, Lord, I, I humble myself in whatever way that, Lord, they're humbling themselves. Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. Maybe you're here. Praise the Lord. Maybe you're here or maybe you're listening. 
um, on video this morning. But if you've made a commitment to the Lord, let us know. Let us know that you gave your heart to the Lord. That strengthens you as well when you do that. Praise the Lord. Be careful going out. God bless you. We will see you next time.